Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Good. That was a big game for the Oilers, Bruce. They uh back at Real 500 for the first time this season. They're at Real 500, so that is huge for any NHL team. Usually, if you're a, a Real 500 team in the NHL, you are in the playoffs. Usually, I don't know. Yeah. I haven't looked at the standings. Are they in the playoff spot right now? Let's have a That's look. why I was just trying to look up, and the site was being a pig. So a 4-2 win over the Ottawa Senators. Uh, this is our Two Good Things, Two Bad Things, and Two Numbers podcast. And because it was a pretty quiet game, we're just going to go with one good thing each, not two. Sometimes we get excited and go with two, or two bad things when it's really horrible. I have but to admit, just, David, I'm not that excited. You're not, eh? No, I found that game pretty excruciating for the most part. I, excruciating in what way? Uh, it was just kind of dull. and, and I mean, the orders were in command. And it was like they were just trying to play keep away and kill the clock rather than, you know, score goals. They stopped trying to score about halfway through the second period, was my take. So, anyway... Yeah. So yeah. It was. I liked it. Mm-hmm. Good. I, I, I'm, I'm a, well, I'm a big fan of the orders winning. So, uh, well, yeah. Oh yeah. Me too. I mean, they had to win. They had to get the, uh, the four points, six points now in the last three days. And the other thing they had to get that they're finally going to get is a break. They played 12 games in 21 days and it's showing in some of their play. I think that they're kind of a little bit in survival mode out there. So, uh, anyway. I see some of the players really rounding into form. So mm-hmm. I, I was encouraged by a lot of the things I saw tonight. I was encouraged by all kinds of players. So, you know, from, uh, from Barry and nurse to pull Yarvi and Haas. So I, I was kind of, I, I was kind of liking it anyway. What was, let's go with your good thing, Bruce. What was your good thing? Okay. Well, my de- good thing definitely tonight is the orders penalty kill. I want a pleasure. It is to say that for the first time all year. But uh, I think that was actually the difference in uh, Edmonton winning this game, or at least in winning it comfortably. This game could have been very uncomfortable had Ottawa managed to snipe a power play or goal or two on their five chances, 10 minutes they had on the power play tonight. And in those, uh, uh, in those 10 minutes, the Oilers held Ottawa to just three shots on net. Uh, a couple of tricky ones that uh, Koskinen had the answer for, but uh, mostly it was the... Uh, the four-man unit uh, working their butts off and uh, getting the job done. And I, I'm just going to credit by ice time. Uh, Chris Russell, 323. Adam Larson, 556. Josh Archibald, 542. Uh, Darnell Nurse, 542. Kyler Yamamoto, 302. William Lagason, 405. Gaetan Haas, 542. And Ryan Nugent Hopkins, 308. So those are all the three minute men that uh, that all played three minutes without getting burned. And of them, I, I was particularly impressed, I, I have to say, with Gaetan Haas on the penalty kill. I wanted to see more of him on the PK last year. And I want to see more of him on the PK now because that's two games in a row. He's looked real strong on that unit. Of course, he's such a smart player. Mm-hmm, he he yeah. reads the game very well and he's very fast. Mm-hmm. Would have been nice to see him score right at the end there. Mm-hmm. And I, I just thought Josh Archibald had a fantastic game, maybe his best game of the year. He was just hitting and hustling like crazy out there. William mm-hmm. Logason is also, um, he's a solid defensive defenseman. And I've yeah. we've con- contended, I've contended for a long time that he can play in a third pairing in the NHL. And I think he's he's showing that. I mean, he and Larson are, are getting the job done, of, you know, advisedly against the Ottawa Senators, which a team that is really struggling right now. But um, he played nine minutes tonight, Lagerson, and uh, Kukuk played eight minutes. So basically they shared the yeah. uh, six, seven role and the other guys kind of played regular, regular minutes in this game. So I wondered how they'd work in that seventh defenseman. So, yeah, they, they, uh, they've needed to, to fill in from for Riley Sheehan and now Jujar Kara, they were two mainstays of the very strong PK and Oscar Clefbaum, 
I actually think Oscar Clefbaum last year did his best work on the special teams and yeah. was outstanding as a PKer. So they've they've struggled replacing all three of those guys. But I think in Haas and Yamamoto, they're getting close. I, I on a, still I, I still would like to see Jesse Puliarvi on the PK. I think that with his size and um, big stick and wingspan, he could he could be a very effective PK player. Um, but the, you know they 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 tried Turris at the start of the year. They're now moving to Haas, and I think it's coming together as a PK unit. Bruce, my good thing was Yessa Um He had the two goals. He he made major contributions to four grade A chances for, not really any against, no major mistakes on a grade A chance against at even strength. Uh, he was confident with the puck all night long, looking to make plays and making plays, as if he had made up his mind before the game that if he's going to get bumped off the third li- thir- first line, he's going to go out trying. And the, his first goal was spectacular, you know, the way he went in there with such confidence and then uh, got off a shot and then deked the goalie. Uh, nice to get a tipped goal. And then he uh, and Bouchard and McDavid came close to making one of the sweetest plays of the year. First with Bouchard uh, picking up the puck and just taking that moment to in the neutral zone to gather himself, get his head up and lofting, saucering a pass over to McDavid at the blue line who then immediately related to Pulley Yarvi charging in. And it was a little bit behind him and he didn't, wasn't able, he was poke checked. He wasn't able to get off a, a shot, but it w- was otherwise, it was just such a spectacular bang, bang play. And it kind of made me honestly salivate at the thought of Evan Bouchard playing regularly with his team, Bruce. He has a level of skill. He has a level of shooting and passing skill already that I don't think any other Oilers defenseman on the roster right now possesses. He, that's how he is such a, he is so strong with the puck. And I, I'm just, I hope they can, I don't know. I don't know. It's going to be a challenge to work him in because it's not like Tyson Berry's playing well. Adam Larson, I think is playing well and Ethan Bear's playing well. So it's complicated. Uh, I'll say. What do you do? Where are you going to cut? Anyway, uh, it, um, uh, to bring work it back to your good thing. I mean, the play I, that really brought the, warmed the cockles of my heart was when uh, Bouchard fired a shot from the point and pulled the RV cruising through the slot, got the tip of his stick on it and deflected it down off the post and into the net for the, uh, uh, was that the fourth Edmonton goal? Uh, uh, was it? Made it four nothing. Uh, but uh, so that was pulled the RV second goal of what was for him a very good game. Uh, his first goal, it was a, a very very high-end athletic play by Yessa himself when, uh, uh, again, he took a pass uh, from McDavid and he had a one-on-one and he cut into the middle. He beat the guy in the middle, got a good shot away. And then what I really liked was how he was able to stop up, step around the guy to recover the rebound and then see the, the goalie was sort of playing him to go to the backhand and he just took it to the other side and popped it into the wide open net. It was a really good read by him all the way through, really. And, and uh, you know, two good chances in a row. And, he, you know, by sticking with it and going after and burying his own rebound, that's that's where goals are scored in this league. A lot of them are on rebounds or just, you know, having a nose for the net when you're in the neighborhood. And that's what he had tonight. So good on Yes, the pool Yarvi. Did he ever need to get off the schneid? Bruce, I find myself wondering half the time, is Jesse Pugliarvi the next Nail Yakupov? And then the other half the time, I wonder, is he the next Blake Wheeler? Mm-hmm. Like, honestly, mm-hmm. it's... Now, I don't think Nail Yakupov had many games like this game that Jesse Pugliarvi just had. He had some, though. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, Pugliarvi is bigger. He's faster. He's a better... He's He can be better with the puck than Yakupov, but he has that same... In some games, when he's not... When, it, when I think he, la- I think it's a confidence thing. And in the games when he lacks confidence, he flubs it up with the puck so often, just like Yakupov did. And he, he throws it away. He doesn't make plays. He gets in other people's way. He does everything wrong with the puck. Almost. It seems it's, it's constantly bouncing off his stick. It looks like it's, it looks like it's, there's something weird with his stick. His everything looks stick. wrong. Yeah. Everything looks wrong with him on the nights when he's not going, but on, we've seen him at least three games this year mm-hmm. where everything yes. has been going. And it has been like, holy yeah. fracamole. Like, mm-hmm. like he looks like a player 
who arguably should have gone in those games. He looks like the player who should have gone fourth overall in that draft pick in that draft. Mm -hmm. Like it would have, you know, and so my hope is this, and this is something we, you know, that we've seen with other really big lanky players. It can take a while, you know, the old Pete Mahovlich, uh, syndrome. Um, I'm sure there's other examples, but just these mm -hmm. bigger guys take a while to, 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 to get their coordination. And he's mm -hmm. taking a while also to get his confidence. But the, yep. he, let's, I, I just want him to see him put a string of those games together now. Like, don't go back now and be timid, Yessi. You know, timid Yessa, where you're just throwing that puck away, man. Like, make up your mind you're going to do it again. Because I think tonight he did make up his mind. Well, you know, the three good games, and I can tell you which they were, 5-2 win over Vancouver in game two. Uh, the 4-3 win over Winnipeg in game number seven. Yeah. And now the 4-2 uh, win over Ottawa in game 12. And here's the common denominator, win, win, win. When Jesse played really <laughs> well, the Oilers won all of those games. And, you know, like when they have another weapon, and, you know, he, and he brings a very different set of skills than, than their other star players do. Uh, but when he's on his game and skating and swooping around and doing that... Uh, uh, condor thing that he can do. Uh, he's hard to handle. Bruce, I noticed, uh, you have something in your eyes there, my friend. Yeah, I do. Get a bug. Yeah. Once I was driving and a bug flew in my eye oh. and it totally blinded me. Mm -hmm. So literally I was going like 50 kilometers down the road, a mm -hmm. bug flew in my eye and it was so painful that I, that I, that my reflexes made me shut both eyes, just like oh. you're doing here. Yeah. I had to shut both eyes and I couldn't open them. And for like, for about 10 seconds, and what are you going to do? You're you're going 50k down the street. You what do you, you can't pull over. So uh, I've had it happen riding a bike in a car. You usually have a windshield to protect you. Pardon me, but uh, in, All right. uh, yeah, in uh, uh, in a, on a bike you're kind of exposed to whatever at whatever speed you happen to be going. So anyway, I don't know what that was about, but every once in a while I get a incident. So, yeah, good for you. So, what he yeah. gives Bruce is finally, because we've now seen Dominic Cahoon have some good games and, and you know, there's good a know. fairly strong assurance that he belongs in the top six. Yep. Um, Pulley Arvey's um, grade A scoring chance plus minus at even strength has been really good all year, but it's mainly built on those um, up till now two good games uh, where he's done most of his good work. So he's he's right up there with Yamamoto and Nugent Hopkins in, in terms of creating great A chances and, and not giving much away at the other end. But he just lets the consistency is I'm just feeling a little bit more confident now though that we're gonna see more good games. Like I've seen it enough now, like there's a pattern here. We're gonna see some more bad games, but I think we're gonna see we, we see what he can do. And um what I noticed tonight was McDavid and, and Nuge were looking for him with for passes, with passes. Yeah. They were actually functioning as a line really for the first time um you know including him in all the plays counting on him to make the right play and he was really confidently moving the puck sometimes which me meant not passing it to mcdavid not looking for mcdavid all the time but passing it to somebody else so we saw some i, I think actually for the first time bruce we saw real chemistry on that line tonight which i found probably the most encouraging thing um, we we saw chemistry. We've seen it from the second line now with uh, Dry Settle, Cahoon, and Yamamoto consistently, and I think the third line tonight also showed a little bit of uh, chemistry. At least Haas and Archibald um, worked well together. So starting to come slowly, starting to come slowly. Bruce, what's your bad thing? Well, I'm going to put the shoe on the other foot, and I'm going to criticize the p power play also. Maybe not the first time all year, but the first time in quite a while because it's been red hot. But tonight's power play couldn't get its stuff together at all. And it was like, it was 4 nothing when they got the first one. And they they lost the puck in the in the offensive zone. And it, I'm, I swear it took them a minute to get it back. Ottawa just kept buzzing yes. around in Edmonton's defensive zone. And Edmonton kept turning the puck over, turning it over. And they they had and then they had another power play, late in the second with the score four one and a goal there ends it, right ends it and uh, both times they they just didn't even come close it seems to me I mean maybe I've missed something or forgotten something but uh, 
they just didn't really generate uh, much of anything. Zero shots at all on the on the second power play. I, re I recall uh, Jack Michael saying, and it was a time. You know, that was a time to put the foot on the throat of the other team and and put the game. Instead, you know, the third period. I mean, they had they had a nice lead, but it was. I was uncomfortable, you know, right up till about five minutes left with playing so much in Edmonton's zone. It was like they were, you know, they just couldn't couldn't put them away. And, and on the night, they only had seven scoring chances, Oilers, against Ottawa. And it was, I mean, I guess they were trying to mind their P's and Q's defensively, and uh, in large part they did. Their issue more was managing the puck again. 20 turnovers, giveaways in this game, and then uh, it was. Uh, uh, I don't say they took them lightly. I don't. I, I, that's not quite the, the right thing, but I think they just tried to ease their way through this 12th game in 21 days a little bit. And really, it was only when they were short that they that they really sort of had to knuckle down and and uh, play those 10 hard penalty kill minutes. That to me were the difference in this game. So I'm still undecided what my bad thing is. I mean, I, there was the, there was the, it's not an Oilers game and kill Kyle, Kyle Turris, Bruce doesn't cover someone in the slot and they get off a grade A shot. And so he's struggling, yeah. um, he continues ever? to struggle. He's really struggling. He was down. How many, how many minutes did he play tonight? Uh, let me just see here. Number eight, 852. I think that might yeah. be a new low. No, no shot attempts. Yeah. He's just really struggling anyway. And I think they should take him out and put Drew Shore in. Um, so, but, or it could be the puck handling or lack thereof from Chris Russell and Zach Cassian, mm -hmm. which I think really stood out tonight, As, you know, um, especially when you have really skilled players like Bouchard and Barry moving the puck, it, it becomes all the more the Russell's inability to, to move the puck. I guess he had three turnovers just comes to the fore. Like he really, you know, I'm just starting to wonder with Lagos and playing so well, and this is what I thought heading into the season that Russell was expendable. Mm -hmm. uh, because Loggison was here, because I think right. William Loggison can do everything Chris Russell can do, but he can do it better. So um, I don't know how many games he has to play to qualify for the expansion draft this year, but um, he has to play twenty-seven, I think, this year. Or Loggison does. What about Russell? To, to no, 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 Russell. The, oh, none. None. He qualifies. He's, he's already there. Yeah, they have to play uh, either. 40 in the year before the draft or 70 in the two years before the draft. And of course, both those years have been prorated because neither of them is the full 82 games. And Russell played enough games last year to already qualify. That was one of the reasons I signed him to that funky one-year extension when they did was that he covered that bet for they have to expose some experienced NHL defenseman. Well, it will be Chris Russell, but it might be Chris Russell and William Lagason, in which case I don't imagine that... Uh, Seattle will be looking hard at Chris Russell. Let's put it that way. Yeah, Lag that's for Lagerson sure. will be. Take, that, yeah, they've worked hard not to expose Lagus, and they've never put him on waivers. But um, that might be the time that uh, that he's uh, out there just because they got no choice. You know, he can't protect everybody. Well, but, you never know. He might be back as the as their third bottom pairing D-man next year, William Lagos, and they might even find a way pretty to Pretty good chance. Him. If I he think. if he beats out Jones, like there's a battle now between Caleb Jones and William Lagos that I can see, and it's going to be an interesting fight. Uh, Are you and, surprised and not, that Jones got the hook tonight? Well, especially with 70? Um, they're just was... working players in, Bruce. They're having them sit. Jones has been up and down. I, I like his play, but you know, I, could, I don't think he's been brilliant. Uh, so no, I, it's okay to take him out. Slater Cuckoo has been really good. So I'm not against him going in. I, I, I like all of the, the defense generally, except I'm not a huge, you know, I think Russell is a, is a cut below and, um, I'm just wondering how you can get Bouchard in there. Bruce, my, my real bad thing though, is the ref on the Colin White hitting Pulley RV in the face. Punching how, is, how is that not, uh, punching chasing him? Chasing him down 200 feet. Chasing punching? him down. And okay. not only that. For nothing, he pulled the RV, dodged a hit, a flying, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a <laughs> flying charge by Dadanov, and he 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 misses it, and and White loses his mind, hunts him down, punches him in the face. How is that not a penalty? Like, on what planet is that not a penalty? It's two minutes, but they got to call two minutes. I, mean, they do. I, I was saying to my wife there that 
you know, maybe the maybe the plan after what the Oilers did on the power play last game was that the plan was that they just we weren't going to get any penalties no matter what. They did get a couple later, but that was that was so obvious it was just kind of maybe, mind-boggling that uh, maybe they thought Pugliarvi had it coming. Like like maybe they maybe they thought Pugliarvi had done so, something horrible that they had missed and like had this coming, and so he's going to take his medicine. Is that could that be? An explanation for not giving an obvious <laughs> penalty. <laughs> I don't know. I would have thought, you know, if they were going to screw up the call, they would give them two minutes each. Even though each. Yasa That's there right. showed a lot of discipline in taking that punch and just hanging in there and not retaliating. And I thought he earned the orders of power play with that discipline. He, but he did. Anyway, it didn't happen. But. What's your number? Uh, my number is zero. Uh, which is the number of points earned tonight by Vancouver Canucks and Calgary Flames, uh, both of whom lost in regulation, which is how it should be. So Edmonton, Edmonton won in regulation against Ottawa, so they, Ottawa also got zero, but that's quickly becoming irrelevant. Uh, but with the two points that they got tonight, Edmonton moved into fourth place in the uh, North Division with 12 points, six wins, six losses. Uh, uh, tied with Vancouver, but Vancouver's played one more game than Edmonton, so they have the game in hand. Calgary's uh, three back with nine points, but they've only played nine games, so also 500. So as they go into the Battle of Alberta on Saturday, those two teams are fighting it out for, as it stands right now, the fourth playoff position, uh, with Winnipeg in third, just one point ahead of Edmonton. And we're already at the point where... You know, this little three-game winning streak has pulled Edmonton out from the depth of, Ooh. you know, fifth or sixth place and right into the mix where I'm already looking at the standings and going, hey, look at we're in fourth. So, uh, but the key there with both those games were decided in regulation. Man, I just so detest the Batman points where the the un, unwon games are somehow worth 50% more points than the games that are won. It's just so backwards how they got that set up. It's it's always yeah. driven me nuts because it, it, there's no there's no logical or mathematical or accounting uh, integrity to it. So Bruce Toronto in second place has a, a with ten games has a goal differential of four. Mm-hmm. Calgary in sixth place mm-hmm. has a goal differential of of three plus three. three. So I, what I'm seeing is five teams they're going to be in a in a real battle five teams and i include toronto yeah. in this I, I don't think from what i saw against the orders at least mm-hmm. uh i don't see toronto being that much better a team than 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 these other teams certainly not better than winnipeg or edmonton and um montreal i'll give them i'll give them their due montreal and ottawa are in different leagues unfortunately one of them is the echl and one of them's uh you know the very top rung of the NHL. So good for you, Montreal. I underrated this this team at the start of the year. But, Plus 17 uh, for Montreal, minus 24 for Ottawa. Yeah. And you know how, this is how it went for Edmonton. Uh, they played two games against Vancouver. They scored seven, they allowed eight. Uh, they played uh, uh, two games against Montreal. They scored two and allowed eight. So minus six, they got crushed by Montreal. Mm-hmm. Uh, they played in all four games against Toronto, 12-4, 12, 12 against, two wins each. All of, These are all splits, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they played against Winnipeg, 8-4, 9 against, with the difference being an empty net goal uh, in the very last second of the second game. Mm-hmm. That uh, was the reason that, uh, um, you know, so basically three, four splits with the, goal, the goals being basically dead even, but Edmonton got crushed by Montreal, and they did crush Ottawa. They, they swept Ottawa with a plus five and got swept by Montreal with a minus six. And otherwise, all basically all close games. Yeah, and I, I do think the Oilers will. I don't know if the other teams will get better, Bruce, but as long as the Oilers' goaltending is picks up a little bit or is okay, mm-hmm. um, I see the rest of the team getting better. I think that um, they're going to find some – they've lacked chemistry. You know, there was a point where every single line lacked a little bit of chemistry, and they're st- starting to get it now. They're starting to find it a little bit more. And um, we're seeing much better play from all the defensemen, generally speaking. So I think that the orders are going to improve. But Winnipeg is going to pick up Pierre-Luc Dubois. Mm-hmm. 
Yep. They should improve. Other teams may improve as well. So, uh, but I, I do think Edmonton. What a relief, man! Just like to be back in the hunt. Yeah. Just to, it, what a what a huge a week relief. ago just, it was easy to see this season getting away from us as le- recently as the third period of Saturday night's game against Toronto when Koskinen made that full length diving save off of Mitch Marner that would have put Toronto ahead late in the third period. Yeah. And and since then Edmonton held on to get to overtime and win that game. And won two more games, and all of a sudden here we are, right smack dab in the middle of the standings. So, after a three and six start, middle of the standings looks pretty good. It looks. I'll take it. That's why I'm happy. Like I'm not. I don't care. I just wanted the two points out of the tonight's oh, game. Oh yeah, honestly. Absolutely. So, um, first my number is nine. It's the mm-hmm. number of uh, shot attempts by Evan Bouchard tonight. Mm-hmm. Nine shot attempts, and a couple of them were absolutely fantastic. Uh, the one where he just whipped it on net and, and pulley RV tipped it he, the perfectly mm-hmm. timed by Bouchard. And he, you know, moved his stick a little bit, moved around a little bit and got that shot off, whipped it at net. And then, you know, there was the other play that ever caught everyone's attention when he, when he moved in off the half wall and absolutely fired the puck as hard as he could at net. And it broke um, the stick of an Ottawa defender. What a hellacious shot. We have not had, a defenseman who can shoot the puck like that since Sheldon Surrey. Is that a fair comment? Mm. And Sheldon Surrey could really shoot yeah. the hell out of the puck. But so can Evan Wonderbomb. So, so can Evan <laughs> Bouchard. Bruce. I mean, Barry could fire the puck too. Tyson, mm-hmm. Barry, Oscar Clefbaum can fire it hard. Nurse can, can get a hard shot now and then. I mean, but this is, he's just in a different category of being mm-hmm. able to fire that puck on net. And I, uh, and is what a statement to make in the first game to get nine shots at net like that. The coaches will notice that. And um, mm-hmm. aside from that one bad line change at the end of the game, mm-hmm. uh, good work, Evan Bouchard. Yeah, four shots got on net, four were blocked. And the one that, say, t- took the guy's stick off, the other one that Stutzla blocked, where oh. <laughs> Bouchard tried to step around and he snapped a wrist shot and Stutzla was hurting, man. He thought... You could just tell by the reaction of the player and the extended reaction of the player that, you know, that was a wrist shot that had a lot of bite to it. And, uh, you know, he really snaps the puck. And, and when he when he fully winds up, he's got a rocket. So I'm looking forward to seeing more of those for sure. It was minutes later, like 10 minutes later, and they they were, they would showed Stutzla on the bench and it looked like he was weeping. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Like, welcome to the NHL. and. Uh. You know what I was thinking, Bruce? I was thinking about that. Like Stutzel is a skilled player and he blocked the shots. Mm-hmm. Nugent Hopkins is a pretty effective penalty killer. But have you ever noticed him blocking a shot on the PK? I was just thinking. Oh, uh, yeah. I remember that time he broke his hand. Maybe okay, that's I... why he's not real anxious to be doing it. Well, yeah, he, he's very effective. Cause, he's, cause my, he actually wondering... might have tried to make a glove save and he, and he stopped it in the palm of his hand. He busted his hand and he was out for a few weeks. Oh, that's no good. This is maybe four years ago now. So I was just Keep wondering, like, how could he, he? How does he do it? Like, because you have to kind of block shots, but he he doesn't really block shots too much on the PK. Maybe he left, leaves that to Jujar Kara to play the top of the top of that formation, the T formation on the PK. But anyway, just I just was thinking about it, because because it's always a question for me is, and it remains one like, should highly skilled players throw themselves in front of shots? And uh, you know, I'm not so sure I want McDavid to do it, but it's almost like everybody's got to do it now in today's game. But Nuge succeeds on the PK generally without, uh, without blocking a lot of shots. So you can be a good uh, penalty killer in the NHL without doing that, evidently. All righty. Any final thoughts, Bruce, or are we packing her in? No, I think we're, we're, uh, we're going to, um, final thoughts are Kachuk and uh, Cassian. And Cassian's got five straight games against the Kachuk. And it took the full two games for uh, him and Brady Kachuk to get it going, but they sure did at the end. That was by far the most serious scrum involving the Oilers all year. And it's just just warm up for Cassian for Saturday night. <laughs> Battle on. How many chucks could it catch your chuck if it could chuck, could chuck chucks? Um, <laughs> This Kachuk seems saner. Um, he seems uh, he's not he's not the total jerk 
that uh, Matthew Kachuk is on the ice. This, this, I, I actually like this Kachuk. He's a good hard nose player. I think he's definitely hard nose, and he's definitely I don't, good. I don't see a lot he's of the dirty real stuff. Good. I don't, well, maybe all I three seen. Kachuks are good, but all, all three of them are big jerks to me. But uh, <laughs> uh, I haven't seen enough of Brady to sort of cast yeah. final judgment on him. Like I, you know, I've seen a lot, lot to be impressed by the guy, but uh, there's a couple of things out there that kind of had me. Like I say, we'll be seeing more of him with all these nine games that Edmonton plays Ottawa this year. I dare say we'll have had a belly full of Brady Kachuk by the end of the season. Have a better opinion of him by or a more developed opinion of him by then. And here's my be final. A better opinion. <laughs> here's my final thought, is Bruce. I don't give a rat's patootie about the rest of the NHL right now. I'm not paying attention. I don't care what happens. It doesn't like. I love. I absolutely love the Canadian division. Mm -hmm. It's great. And, and if they did this, if they said, this is going to be it, man, we're just going to have a Canadian division for the, to the end of time. That'd be great. I, with, no I would, over, with no interlocking play, you know, nope. like it is this year, all yeah, four different no leagues. Interlock, I'm cool with that. I don't want, it's they're the mystery, right? It's like quite what's fascinating. Going then you meet in the playoffs and it's, mm -hmm. and yeah, then you, yeah, it's like in a, a very interesting experiment, but I love this. I, I, I hate having to watch teams from California and Texas and Florida. I just find it so boring compared to this. So I, I, I just a total fan of the Canadian division. And, you know, even if they just kept it and they had some interlocking play, that'd be okay too. But I hope they keep it. And I don't, I don't know if they, they probably won't for all right. kinds of reasons, but man, I, I wish they would. Well, this year it's like four separate leagues out there. And it takes me back to two very specific times in my life. When uh, first of all, when I was first getting yeah. into hockey in the in the mid '60s, and of course there was original six, so you did see the same teams over and over again. They had a 70 game schedule, and every team played every other team 14 times. And then again in the playoffs, you know, a couple of couple of uh, matchups. Uh, and then in the late seventies, when I first got season tickets for the Oilers, they were in the WHA just That's at right. the end of the WHA when it was eight teams reducing to seven and finally reducing to six uh, in the final season of the WHA. So same thing. You would see the same visitors and build up these uh, fairly uh, healthy or unhealthy rivalries uh, against them, players on certain teams that you saw over and over again. And... Uh, this is, reminds me of both those times where you have a very condensed uh, league and you don't have a bunch of games against teams that, you know, this, they're in a different set of standings or it doesn't matter at all. You know, if they take points, you know, if they got a loser point or whatever, it doesn't matter. These games, all the points matter. And it's, uh, it's great fun. I wonder what the players would think, though, if they didn't have that road trip through California in January or Florida in <laughs> February. Like, if they missed that. If you're just in the Canadian division the whole time, having mm -hmm. Canadian w weather the whole time. But what I'm hopeful, Bruce, is this, that the Canadian um, division will prove so popular with mm -hmm. fans, such a moneymaker mm -hmm. for uh, Roger Sportsnet, um, and the, the, and advertisers that they will insist on this and there won't be a question about it. So that's, uh, that's my, uh, my dream. Of course, the American teams are going to say, we've got to see Connor McDavid and Austin Matthews. So no, but maybe money talks, money talks. So I hope it just makes a big pile of money for them and works out well for them and for the fans. Cause I don't think I'm alone in this. Maybe I, maybe I'm. Oh no, you're not. And I've heard person after person say they're totally immersed in the Canadian division. They don't know what's going on in the other divisions. And I've said myself and, and meant it that I don't know which teams are in which divisions down there. I do watch the highlights. Of course, I'm in a couple of hockey drafts, so I do follow who's scoring points and stuff, but, uh, it's, uh, uh, I'm very indifferent as to the results or who's leading what division. I mean, here's one, Carolina 12, Florida 11, Dallas 11, Tampa Bay 11, Columbus 11, Chicago 10. <laughs> so, you know, it's going to be close wherever you look, I think. But it's, uh, it's, um, uh, I don't care. It's all like, Canadian division happens, all the time care. for me. Hmm? And this also gets a Canadian team into the semifinals. Yes, it does. So that's, that's the other really good thing about it. So there's, there's all of these. Like the old Smythe division in that extent. I mean, in those days you played a lot of extra games against your own division, but you did play the other teams in the league, and, but the playoffs were strictly divisional. 
and we're going to get it was that. Edmonton, Calgary, Winnipeg, and either Vancouver or Los Angeles in the in the opening playoff round every year. And they actually have, I mean, look at the banners in uh, next time you're allowed into Rogers Place, look at the banners up there, and they'll actually say Smythe Division Champion, Campbell Conference Champion, Stanley Cup Champion. You know, yeah, they get one each stage along the way because they have an actual division champion, which is something that's kind of gone away during this wild card. Uh, equal rights era because we're going to get and hopefully the others will be there we're going to get these great playoffs right between mm -hmm. canadian teams like oh, this winning. is just going to be this, this is a you know winning too bad that, too bad that a worldwide pandemic deadly pandemic had to cost this yeah. but it is a uh, silver lining on a very 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 dark cloud bruce mm. thanks for talking tonight yeah thanks for listening everyone and in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.